you're in a situation where lots of production is being done, especially manual production is being done in countries that don't have the regulatory capacity to ensure the safety of workers in these factories. And so it's falling on multinationals who are doing business with these companies to take on this quasi-regulatory role. They're not trained or equipped to be regulators, they're learning as they go. Some of the foundational moments in how we got to today is some really salient exposés that happened in the 80s and 90s. One was about Nike's supply chain, that there were allegations of child labor in some of the factories that were supplying their goods. There was a big expose about Kathy Lee Gifford, where it was revealed that some of her clothing was being manufactured in a Central American factory with problematic working conditions. This was sort of a, a big awakening to brands to recognize that although they outsource the production, they can't outsource all the risk of the conditions of the production. What that led to is garment companies and then really other industries as well, electronics, for example. It's creating codes of conduct that they're asking their suppliers to adhere to. Many of these brands are actually hiring auditors that are akin to financial auditors. In this case, you're hiring these social auditors to go assess factory conditions. We analyzed uh, about 16,000 codes of conduct audits that were conducted at around 6,000 factories around the world. We controlled for everything we knew that ought to affect the variation in violations at that factory. Was it their first audit or second audit or third audit? Uh, what time of the year was it? What industry are they in? How old is the factory? Beyond that, we threw in these variables that we thought really they only ought to show up as an influence if there's bias going on. Who pays for the audit? Shouldn't matter, but it turns out if the factory pays for the audit, fewer violations are flagged in the audit report than if the brand pays. So that suggests a potential conflict of interest. Is the audit team all new people or have some of them been to that factory before? There's a rationale to send some familiar faces back because they've been there, they have already established their relationships, they know where, where the problem spots are. But it turns out that there's a downside to that. If you send a team where even just one member has been there before, they tend to flag fewer violations. When you send in a fresh team, they may look at things that were there in the first place, but just hadn't been flagged. And then a third issue is the gender composition of the team. Prior research has shown that women work in different ways than men. Uh, they're more likely to be rule followers. Uh, they're more likely to take in more information before making snap judgments. And it's for these potential reasons why we find that audit teams that have only women or that are mixed flag more violations than all male teams. Finally, we sort of validated some intuition by finding that more highly trained auditors not only find more violations, but also prompt more improvement. And that suggests that they're good at their job both at documenting uh, what's going on, but also sharing tips with how those problems can be remedied. There's not been much attention to this question about bias or, or quality of audit. We're really looking into what are the, the things that managers in these factories can do, what is it that brands can do to try and improve practices, to think more carefully about the assignment process of who goes on the audits.